It's your son, and now we pray, send your spirit to teach us so that we might become uh, more like Jesus and shine uh, your light into a world that so desperately needs to know your son, in whose name we pray, amen. So in May of 2003, I almost died. You don't forget moments like that. I had just arrived in Florida to a church I just began serving, and they wanted to welcome me uh, with a pool barbecue party. (laughs) And with the pool barbecue party, there are high school kids that are there, and their game was, how quickly can we get the pastor into the pool? Well, I was much younger then, um, and I'm really competitive, and so I'm not going in easy. And then kept throwing them in, but eventually numbers and just strength wear out, and I'm in the pool. And much to my dismay, uh, it didn't end at the pool, (laughs) because then it was dunking, and I'm throwing kids around the pool. Of the high school wrestlers was behind me with his arm um, around my neck, and I couldn't breathe anymore, and I was trying to get his neck, and the last thing I remember was nothing. What happened is I fell to the bottom of the deep end of the pool. And I remember having just this peaceful moment of just memories memories of childhood, (laughs) friends, just memories, just a really peaceful kind of moment. The next thing I I know, um, I'm coming out of the pool. It was like I was shot out of a cannon coming out of the deep end of the pool, gasping for breath and going like, what happened? And I hear the high school kids saying, wow, we didn't know you could hold your breath at all. <laughs> no, I wasn't holding my breath at all. Like I was not there. I said, who got me out of the water? I said, well, nobody got you out of it. No, somebody got me out of the water because I was like shot out of the water. I don't remember leaving and I know uh, what God, God got me out of the water in that moment. I was looking around. I'm like, where are all the adults that are supposed to be supervising this? Does anybody not care what's going on? I almost lost my life that moment. And when you have a moment like that where you're that close to losing your life, um, you live differently. Those who have died and come back to life live differently. And maybe it's because I'm at this season of my life. Um, it really is, would be the fall. If you break up 20 years segments. I'm in the fall season uh, of my life. So I realize that there's more time behind me than there is in front of me. And I'm really cognizant of that because I got married later in life and my wife and I um, had our daughter sort of later in our life and my daughter uh, is now 11 in fifth grade. But I can remember um, holding her in the hospital like it was yesterday. Those of you who've been parents, you know what that's like. I, I remember holding her, feeling I, I can't imagine loving anybody more than I love this little girl. And I remember God whispering, no, I, I love her more. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I can't even comprehend more than the love I have for this child right now. And I look, and it seems like yesterday I was holding her watching a football game. I'm glad you can't see that on the screen because that's what I was watching in the hospital room. But she was just sleeping on my chest. And I treasure that moment. Uh, On the other side of the extreme, just a few weeks ago for Thanksgiving, I was up in Michigan where I was born and raised. Um, That's my mom. She turned 90. She's late with all She really doesn't recognize me anymore. But I, I love going to see her. And I loved it because my daughter was there too and being able to spend some time with grandma who doesn't even know her anymore, at least not as far as we can tell. But I'm I'm looking at my daughter and my mom at both opposite ends of life and thinking, boy, how quickly life goes by. And when you realize you've come close to death, you live differently. But here's what's true of all of us that are here today. You you fall into one of two categories. Either you are dead or you were dead. Those are the only two categories we fall in. You either are dead or you were dead. And the reason I can say that is our text from Ephesians, if you look at verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Not that, oh, I have a little problem. Not that, oh, I probably should ask for forgiveness. Not that, well, I am better than most people, but I can admit to a few faults. 
No, we were dead. That's what sin does. Sin destroys. It kills. And we were dead. That was our condition. Every single one of us has that story. But not too many people think about that story. Because if you have come back from the dead, you live differently. But this is what he says. And it goes on then in verse 4, skipping down a few verses. But because of his great love for us. And I love the fact that there's a but. Because we were dead. And that could have been the end of the story. But because of his great love for us. God who is rich in mercy. Made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. It is by grace that you have been saved. And I realize if you're like me, I've got friends of mine who have walked away from Jesus. I have friends that I know that don't want anything to do with Jesus or his church. And I realize that can touch a nerve uh, for people. Because I imagine some of you have family members and friends. Maybe some you just saw over Thanksgiving. They want nothing to do with Jesus or his church. And it pains you because you can see what Paul wrote about. That they're dead in their trespasses and sin. And we don't have the power to bring anybody to life. There's no spiritual CPR that I can do on people to bring them to life. And there's nothing that you can do to bring them to life. But God, who is rich in mercy... Send a son to bring us to life. How does that happen? This is why I love this text of scripture. I mean, it so resonates with me, especially Christmas time. We are going to be filling um, trees, most of us, because we live and we have much more than we really need. And so we'll have a lot of things under the tree. Most of those things we don't need, but we give each other gifts. And so often it's so easy to neglect the greatest gift of all, the gift of, of life. And when we realize we've gone from death to life, we, we live differently. And, and so Paul reminds us this morning, how, how do I get that? <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it's by grace that you have been saved. Grace. <laughs> Uh, we're uncomfortable with grace because we like to earn it. I mean, we like to deserve it. I, I do. Man, I, I like to work hard and point to things that I've done. But, but grace doesn't allow us to point to ourselves. Grace admits that we are completely dependent on someone else. And, and we don't like grace because we can't tangibly go to the store and buy grace. We can't call down grace uh, uh, upon us. There's nothing we can do to get grace. It's by grace, though, we have been saved. Well, then how, how do we know if we have this, this grace uh, upon us? How does he get it to us? It's by grace that we have been saved. Well, what's next then? How does that get to us? Well, through faith. Faith is the vehicle by which we, we have this grace. And this is why it's beautiful to have little children up here. And I love the fact that they ask questions. I don't know what it is about adults that this is what we've learned to do. We just sit and be quiet and don't ask any questions. We, we should be asking questions. I'm still asking questions. There's a lot of things I still want to know. So how, how do we get this grace? Well, it's, it's through faith. Which leads to a very natural question. Well, where do I go get that? Is that a Walmart? Can I pick that up at Kroger? Can I get that somewhere else? Is that passed down from generation to generation? Do I, I get that from my parents? Where do I, I get this faith? And, and Paul jumps right in as if he knew what you were going to ask. He says, no, this is not from yourselves. You don't manufacture this. You don't get it. You don't go and obtain it. It's by grace that you have been saved. Through faith. This is not from yourselves. 
There's nothing we bring to the equation, which makes the gospel so incredibly beautiful. But God, who is rich in mercy, sent a son to bring us from death to life. This is not of yourselves. What is it? It's a gift of God. It's a gift. Boy, better than anything we can wrap and put under a tree. Man, more amazing than, than we'll ever fully comprehend and understand. I, I know the tendency sometimes is the, the longer we've followed Jesus, and some of you I know in here have followed Jesus a lot longer than I have. And I know sometimes the tendency of my heart is, okay, yeah, I know that. I know that story. Yeah, okay. And, and we just forget to let our souls just go, wow, there is a God who created this universe who could have just let me die. But because of his great mercy, he brought, made me alive. And that's my story. And that's a lot of your stories today. And that's a gift of God. Like, well, what do I have to do then? And as Paul knew, like what you were going to say, um, he knew right after that, no, it's not by works. There's nothing you have to do to earn this or deserve it. So don't think you can work for it. God didn't give you his grace. He didn't give you the gift of faith because you look good or because you're better than anybody else. Because you were the same as everybody else. Dead in your trespasses and sin. It's not by works so that no one can boast. I can't boast about my faith. You, you can't boast about your faith. We were dead. I was at the bottom of the pool. I, I couldn't do anything. Incapable at that moment of doing anything to save myself. God had to act. And he did. Miraculously. We can't bring ourselves physically back to life. We can't bring ourselves spiritually back to life. God has to act. And this is what he does. And so now, go back to, you're in one or two camps. You either were dead, or, or you, you are dead. And, and today, if, if you're dead, and if I'm speaking to dead people today, and I know there are, I don't think there's a single church that's gathering today where there's not some dead people who are gathering. If you're not a believer today, the one thing I can just encourage you to do today is just continue to hear the message Continue to hear the, well, I don't get it. I don't understand. It's okay. Just keep hearing the message. Keep hearing the message. And I've talked to a lot of people who don't believe in Jesus, and they have great questions. Like, if there really is a God of mercy, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Why do children have diseases and get sick, and, and some of them die? Why did this happen in my life if God is, is so good? And I heard somebody explain this to somebody which I thought was a great explanation. You know, you are asking really, really good questions. These are calculus kind of faith questions. But before we can get to calculus kind of questions, you've got to understand the elementary truth of the faith. That God, in his mercy, wants to bring you from death to life. So if you're not a believer, if you're dead, um, keep hearing and if you know somebody who is dead, just keep preaching the word to them. Because this is what we know from Romans. Faith comes from hearing the message. The message of the word of Christ. This is what Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing. And so we want to remove any obstacle in the way. So just keep preaching the word over and over. Don't get wrapped up in calculus kind of questions that people have. You don't have to dismiss those. You can say, we're going to get to those. But man, you got to understand this first because this will never make sense until you understand that you were dead and God made you alive again. Now, if you are a believer today, if your story is like mine, that God brought you from death to life today, I, I want to encourage you to, one, choose life. Which sounds sort of crazy. If you listened carefully to our Deuteronomy lesson for today, this is what Moses told to his people in Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, verse 19, where he says this. I call heaven and earth as witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. 
Therefore, choose life so that you and your offspring may live. Choose life. Am I choosing to follow Jesus? No. No, we made that abundantly clear. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is a gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast. You're, you're not choosing. What you are choosing is to stay in life. Because what pains me is when I've seen people who are living and they choose to die again. See, what John wrote about in John chapter 10 is, is absolutely true. John chapter 10, nobody can snatch them out of my hands. My Father who has given them to me, Jesus said, is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. But it doesn't mean you can't jump out of the Father's hands. It doesn't mean you can't drift out of the Father's hands. And so Moses reminds us and God wants to remind us today, choose life. And don't go back to being dead in your trespasses and sin. Because you've got a great story. You've got a death to life kind of story that you can share with people. That God, in his great mercy, decided to bring you from death to life. I want to share with you a story where this became really real for me. I uh, grew up, my dad was an engineer at Ford Motor Company. And my very first car I bought was this Ford Escort uh, GT. My first car was a 71 Torino with 100,000 miles on it, didn't have a radio or an air conditioner. And so I drove that for a long time. But when I was in the seminary getting ready to go on Vicarage, I'm like, you know what? I probably should have a more reliable car than one that's as old as I am. And so my dad said, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Why don't we go and let's look at cars and this is really what I could afford. And so I got an Escort GT and so I had that. And so I went to Houston, my first call, right down by NASA. And I was down there, uh, I was working with a lot of students. And a lot of the students down there would get new cars for their 16th birthday. Did anybody, by the way, get a car given to you, a brand new car when you were 16? No, I didn't either. Like, and I'll just admit, I was a little bit upset with, with that. And one day, Chelsea uh, rolls into church, 16-year-old Chelsea, with a brand new blue Mustang. And she came to check out my new car. And I could feel that tinge in my spirit because the tinge in my spirit was, man, my, my dad, that was one of the last cars he worked on before he retired was a Mustang. And I, I told my dad, I want to get a Mustang convertible. He's like, you can't afford a Mustang convertible car. And it's not practical. It doesn't get good gas mileage. Just, you know, hey, hey, escort. This is a really, really good car. And so I saw the car. I'm like, man, that's the one I wanted to have. And, and so sticker still on the, the you know, window of the car. I'm like, hey, Chelsea, that's great. Did you buy it? I didn't buy it. I can't afford the car. My parents bought it for me. Oh, do you pay for the insurance on the car? No, I can't afford it. You know what insurance is for teenage drivers? It's pretty, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm aware of that. It's pretty expensive. Well, how about maintenance? Do you do any maintenance on this brand new car of yours? You're going to have to do any? Oh, no, my parents want to take care of the maintenance since it's a new car. They want to make sure it's done. So they're taking care of all the maintenance. How about gas? Do you put gas in the car, Chelsea? Anything? No? Well, my parents give me a gas card, um, but I'm not allowed to use it for anything but gas. I can't buy sodas and candy with it. It's just gas. It's just a ga I'm like, so really, you didn't buy it? You're not paying for the insurance? You're not doing the maintenance on it? You're not even putting gas in this car? Chelsea, exactly what part of this car is yours? Because <laughs> you didn't do anything for it. <laughs> I said, really, Chelsea, what you need to be saying is, hey, pastor, check out this car that was given to me as a gift. That would be a little more accurate. And I could see, oh, yeah, I guess so. I'm like, I I'm sorry. And I told her, I, I need to apologize. I part of this is jealousy on my part. So I just need to get over that. But I, I said, I think it's a beautiful picture sometimes of what we do with God. And I wonder if God isn't looking at us and we say, hey, look at my faith. And God looking down like, really? Did you bring yourself from death to life? Did, did you die on a cross that your sins could be paid for and forgiven? that you didn't have to do anything for it. And I wonder sometimes if we just don't hold that out. <laughs> and God's going, oh, you don't understand what I did when I brought you from death to life. Because those who have died and have come back to life, they live differently. And we should live differently. And that should reflect our worship
That should reflect our praise. That should reflect the way we walk out the doors this morning. It should reflect the way we wake up tomorrow morning. It should reflect in our conversations with people that I've got a story to tell you. I was dead and God made me alive again. This is the story that God wants for every single one of us because of his great mercy for us. Thanks be to God who has given us this incredible victory in him. And so now we have an opportunity to respond uh, to him by giving to him only uh, what he has first given to us as we return to him with our tithes and, and our offerings. And so uh, it is a way uh, to worship God this morning. And so I don't even know how we do this, but we, I guess, are gathering our offerings now at this time. So thank you.